I've uh, studied online for quite some time. I did my master's online. I did a blended master's and mostly it was an online and we had a few sessions uh, first first. So I would say that online learning is uh, learner centered. It has a lot of responsibility that is put on the learner and therefore it requires one to be self-directed. It requires one to, uh, a learner to take the initiative but also it requires a lot of support from the university because in most cases the isolation that comes with online learning with no support uh, the dropout rates can be high and um, completion rates low so i i see i see online learning being um, learner centered and requiring a lot of support from the universities or from the institutions that offer such programs Uh, what I can think about in that regard on the side of the university administrators, I think they should consider uh, to look into issues of policy and issues of uh, like offering incentives to the people who are involved in online education to find it rewarding because it's somehow a new thing uh, to most of the implementers. I think they need to do, to, to do some more in terms of encouraging and interesting people to take on online education, even to teach online, because in some of our universities, it's not something that's been so much welcomed by most of the facility uh, faculty members. But I think if the university administrators do more of a sensitization, boom, uh, continue to do uh, trainings such that people can have the necessary skills and also some sort of awards and incentives, I think that one will encourage so much uh, to take. Uh, online learning to the next level as institutions i feel we are moving in a direction in a good direction we shouldn't because we, this period of covid has taught us many things and now that it's um, not gone but subsidized most institutions are now moving back to traditional uh, instruction so i believe as universities and educators we should keep pushing the agenda for online learning and teaching, we should not uh, go back to the to the old style just because COVID is gone. Welcome to EdTech Mondays. Our focus this month is on e-learning at the university level. During the COVID-19 lockdowns, 77% of universities in Africa were forced to shut down, making the number one of the highest rates of closures in the world. The closures greatly slowed down learning and reduced the learning outcomes and margins for African students. In this episode, we want to speak to experts on how digital learning can be incorporated into higher learning and the strategies and investments to make that possible. Thank you so much for joining us, our experts today. I'll allow you guys to introduce yourselves to my audience and I'll start with you, Haula. Um, my name is Baiga Haula, a petroleum engineer by profession. I'm working with Nexus International University as the programs coordinator, which is a fully online university. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Raymond. My name is Gerald Odur. I'm currently working as a technology officer for GS Virtual Learning. I'm a software engineer by profession. And uh, GS Virtual Learning is an online company that was set up during the COVID break, break, uh, outbreak um, just to spark innovation in ed tech to ensure continuity of learning. We have, we have uh, worked with the, the, the groups in the K-12 area and now we're also looking out, out of that. Thank you. Thank you, Raymond. My name is Birunji Anna. I'm a, a finalist at Macquarie University and I'm pursuing a bachelor's degree in information systems and technology. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think we'll start with you. Um, during the lockdowns, how did that affect your learning at, at the university? At the beginning, of course, education was shut down. At the university, we're not studying at all for some good months. Then after some time, that's when they brought in online studies using the different platforms like Zoom, Moele, that's for our university, Macquarie University. Yes. Was the learning any different from the physical learning? Yes, it was different because this was something new. 
who are studying online something we're not used to, requiring us to, to use the laptops or smartphones. And uh, it was kind of hard mm -hmm. for the first time. It was our first time doing this. We had never used it. It was hard for us. Mm -hmm. But then as time went by, we got used to this mm -hmm. and actually liked it. I should ask you the harder question. <laughs> were you more attentive in, in, in the online lessons than you were with the offline lessons? Or do you think that your learning outcomes were better on, online than they were offline? Of course, attention was so minimal. You know, you're at home. So many distractions. But then you're studying, they call you. You're doing this, someone comes calling out your name. But then... As time went by, we, we managed paying attention. Yeah, went on like that. <laughs> All right. How like, your university is completely online. Um, uh, what was the experience like for you guys? Did you have any break or there was continuity in education also? During COVID, we actually did continue with the studies. During that time, we, we even got a project that taught uh, students online. Ugandans to do the greenhouse gas inventory. So we had different uh, participants from Ministry of Energy, Ministry of uh, Agriculture, NFA. So we did continue studying. It was a good time for them because there was, they were not doing much. The, all they were doing is studying and staying at home. Mm -hmm. So we did continue, with, even with the continuing students, we did continue with them. Gerald, I, I want to come to you because from the two of them, of course, innovation really was the problem here. Um, a lot of the universities didn't know how to work um, with e-learning platforms. What kind of innovative space um, was created in these last three years during the lockdown that allowed for quick adoption of, of e-learning? Thank you for that, uh, Raymond. I think uh, the biggest thing that came about during that time was um, the way innovation normally happens is... Um, at, uh, um, according to a diffusion of innovations, um, it takes a couple of steps. There is normally a knowledge step. The, the knowledge step is where there is um, a talk. There is, there is information about um, an innovation. And in this case, it's edtech. Then after that, um, you find um, the, the, the part where people are um, convinced to take on these uh, innovations. And after that, uh, people are expected, people, people then make a choice. They make a decision whether to adopt this or not. Uh, and from there, we find implementation. Uh, and after the implementation, you'll find three different groups. There's the early adopters who remain at the end. And then there is uh, people who were early adopters, but they dropped it. And then there's people who, let, who are late adopters, and then they took it. And there are people who are late adopters who didn't take it at all. So in Uganda or in Africa, most of this was kind of mashed together. So you find that after, after the education, after the ed tech, um, after this break, after the COVID break, uh, there's a bit of a less, there's a drop in innovation in, in, in the uptake of uh, edtech. So um, to answer your question, so um, for universities, um, since all this was mashed up, people actually didn't have time to learn. They didn't have time to appreciate all this, all this uh, technology. And that brought about a case where they're not taking it on very much. If you talk to university students right now, you'll find that a vast majority of them just use it for accessing their notes, um, putting a few, um, a few assessments here and there, uh, and also the, you will not find anything more than that, actually. A little, yes. a little, a little different from what you're saying. Yes. Um, for for us, when when they start, there's always an orientation. When as soon as as soon as you get onto the platform, we give you an orientation class and teach you how it works. It's of course a crash course, but it, the orientation is always there. And best since it's fully online, we do have platforms that are not uh, WhatsApp, but are 
uh, on the learning platform itself. They're called wikis or forums where the questions are put by the tutor in, in during, I mean, when it's not class time, mm -hmm. on normal days when there's no class time, they put a question, the students uh, reply to it. Yeah, so it, we keep it engaging. You have to keep it engaging mm -hmm. for, the, for the students so that they don't get off the platform. Mm -hmm. was, was this the case for all your classmates? Were they all able to adapt to online learning? Um, or did the learning outcomes become different in when, yeah? Not everyone adopted to this. I mean, we were in different places where we stay, our home areas. Some are in town, some are in villages. So it so happened that those who would access these materials, like laptops or smartphones, they're the only ones who would attend class. And then there are these who didn't even know that studying was ongoing. They really missed out on that. So the outcome wasn't so good because just a few students turned up for the studies and other students were left out. Jared, education is one of those areas where um, it must be equal for everyone. I mean, if you're attending a class, you all must be present in the class to benefit from it. The next lesson is another class altogether. How do you structure innovation in such a way that early adopters, late adopters are all on the same board and moving together and their learning outcomes improving in, on, on e-learning? Okay, I think the first, the first thing I'll do um, is have a, a, a sort of assessment um, for everyone. So you find a needs assessment. The people who are maybe in far too rich areas um, will also you know, have their own custom solution, depending on that. Uh, from that assessment, then you can then um, customize your, your learning experience. There's some people who prefer to have um, live lessons. Then there's others who prefer to have recorded lessons. Um, and then there's some people who want a blended system where there's some live lessons and then there's some that are, are recorded. Yes, so it starts all from the needs assessment. How, how, give us your experience around structuring orientation for students to get to adopt to e-learning. How does that orientation happen in, in such a way that it's broad and it allows for everyone to be an adopter of, to online learning? Um, a Zoom link is sent out. You carry out, there's, first of all, people don't know how to use Zoom. So as you send out the link, you give them directions on how to use it. Always be available because they'll give you a call. No, the link is not working. The password has refused. So you always mm -hmm. have to be available mm -hmm. and to help them log in. Once they've logged in, the, the Zoom is a, is a different package and the learning platform is a different package. So once they've logged in, you teach them how to use Zoom, raise up your hand, um, unmute, mute to talk. You then teach them how to use the learning management system itself, where the notes are, where, um, where the Zoom, it's the Zoom uh, things are as well. So it's, it's, it's a learning curve for them. But speak to us also about um, equality in, in learning outcomes. For people that would love to have the kind of education that you offer, who, as she said, don't have the, the kind of infrastructure, they don't have laptops, they don't have mobile phones, or they're in places where the internet access isn't as fast as, in, as, as others. I, I presume if you're doing a Zoom link, it might take longer for some people. Uh, how do you onboard such kinds of people? You, that's, that's a bit of a challenge, mm -hmm. yeah. So some people still don't have internet in their areas. You get a student in South Sudan and they say, I won't be able to attend class on Monday. Mm -hmm. So what we tell them is the class will be recorded and sent to you and you will be able to log it, to, to use, to click the link and view what was pre-recorded before. But apart from that, there are some challenges, of course, internet access, uh, people that don't have phones. Mm. We encourage those to come to the, to, to, to the learning, to, to, the, to the university because they have computers and internet free for them to use. But apart from that, you can do so much. Mm. Yeah. What we did, eh? yeah. in, in this case here, what we did as just virtual learning is, we, we, I wouldn't say partnered, but we, we, we talked to Airtel and they gave us an interesting bundle um, that was customized for learning. Um, it was safe and secure and we, we would give it as part of our package to all our learners. <clears throat> and in that case, they were able to attend and they really loved it. 
Okay, that, that's good. If, if we will come to you before we go to the break, um, from your experience attending physical class and attending online class, if you could rewind to the time that you were joining university, which one would you pick and why would you pick that one? Personally, I'd pick online mm -hmm. because it's convenient. I mean, you can study from anywhere and at any time. <clears throat> uh, it's convenient in a way that even when you don't understand something, these, these lessons are recorded. So you can revisit and replay. If you didn't understand a concept, you can understand it. You can study at any time, unlike physical, whereby if a lecture is at eight, it's at eight. You're not there by eight, you're missing out. And what is taught won't be taught again, it's gone. But with a case with online, you can go and rewind. Yes. All right. Thank you so much. Let's take a very short break. We get back and continue the conversation for online learning in higher universities of Africa. Thank you so much for staying with us on EdTech. We're speaking about online learning at higher university and we're speaking about the challenges, but we want to move towards the solutions. You did mention partnerships with the private sector. Um, how different would you love the private sector to partner with learning institutions to make sure that there's continuity of learning from your experience? Yeah, so the first thing I'll say is um, when we um, talk to Airtel, Unfortunately, they didn't give us a partnership. So I think the, the, the first thing I would say is they should be open to these partnerships. And these partnerships should be a two-way, give and take. Um, I've seen areas where, where I would like learning to happen, far away from the cities, and there's no infrastructure. If we had a partnership with, say, Airtel, and they would help us go and, you know, work on the signals in such places, they would really help. That's one facet I would talk about. Then another facet I would um, mention is, depending on what they're doing. So we're currently working with a partner um, who, who, who's, who has access to a lot of schools all over the country. And what they're doing is they, they have a lot on their plate and our part of it is we're training, we're training teachers. So they offer us chances to train teachers and while they also ask for content and all this from you know us. Those are the kinds of partnerships I would like mm -hmm. to see. How, what kind of, of private partnerships would you love to ease online learning for, for students that come to university? Um, first, we'll look at the challenges that were internet and the devices. The internet, I think Airtel has a package for students, mm. but if they could uh, broaden it a bit to, or cheapen, make it cheaper a mm. bit, and they should access, sh they should go to those further points of the country, because there are people that would like to study, maybe have a gadget, but the internet is extremely bad. So if they could do that, I think that would be very helpful. Mm. The gadgets, now the gadgets, because they're people that want to study but don't have access to a laptop or a phone, because with online learning you can learn on your phone even. So if, if uh, the government could help and give, give out a few of the gadgets, that would be very helpful. And just the answer to that, as just what you're learning, we have a package, we have a product called Own and Pay Over Time, which provides students and uh, instructors with um, with loans, soft loans for getting, we actually get the gadgets, we give them to them, and then they pay over time, up to a year. And this is running, we have um, been running it for half a year now. Mm -hmm. We've had over, I think over 60 people have been interested, and the, 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 the numbers keep growing, so we'd be very interested. Oh, that, that's a really brilliant initiative. How, how would you love for, for private sector to come in and make your learning experience easier? I, I know that you're a finalist, but you might return for a master's degree and, and find the same problems. How would you love for that process to be smoothed out for you? First of all, I would like for them to get awareness. Training among the students. Some students are not offering IT courses, so some of them don't even know how to use a computer. 
or they have smartphones, but they can't use it to study. So if we had these training programs to train the different students in universities, even from those doing arts courses, to learn how to use these gadgets, that would be helpful so that it would make online learning easier, much easier than it is right now. Yeah. How, the, the, the problem she speaks about isn't just f unique to students. I know that during the lockdowns, it also affected lecturers. There were lecturers who the entire life had never had to do an online lecture. And all of a sudden, you have to tell them to throw all their content online. How do you resolve such a challenge? Um, because the pedagogy for teaching online and teaching live classes is different. Mm -hmm. So there's a short course called pedagogy on distance learning or online learning. So those uh, tutors should take an initiative to learn how to digitalize content to be able to suit online learning. Yes. Do you agree with that, that the content has to be like, specific uh, to, to online learning? It's different from physical learning. And in which case, of course, you now have to retool the lecturer to start looking at their content differently. I do agree with her that um, the way that people are taught online is definitely different from the way they are taught um, physically. Um, you find uh, nuances. If someone, <coughs> if someone is uh, physically available, they have to be there at a certain time and at a certain space. Uh, offline learning happens in a space and in a time, while Online learning is kind of different. It's, you know, ubiquitous. The word is ubiquitous. So um, the way you teach it is different. The kinds of assessments you'd give would be different. Um, the way you'd carry yourself would be different. So I do agree with her that when trainers are getting onto this, when instructors are getting onto this, they have to be taught, they have to be trained. Then there needs to be a training plan for that and not just the trainers um, but the students and then also if if there's any other people at, at their homes who need to also be involved in this as a consumer of this education um, did you feel like your lecturers needed to do a little bit more to engage you keep you attentive or assess you better and how different would it have been done to, to keep your attention together in the classroom? Well, first of all, these, our lecturers were using different kinds of me uh, different methods to, uh, to, to bring the work to us. Some of them could record and actually just share the recordings. Some of them did it real time, Zoom, talking as this, but then of course, that to do some improvements to keep us interactive. I mean, so a lecturer just comes and starts talking, not asking questions. You're not keeping us in the class. Like, literally, you're just talking, not allowing us to, to, to also contribute. That was kind of a challenge. I mean, someone could just log on to the class, leave the gadget there, does their own stuff. Because they know the lecturer won't ask anything. They won't engage them. They won't even know whether, okay, Anna is logged on, but is she really studying or not? You get? So that one was hard. So th something had to be done about that. Yeah, keeping us interactive in class. Hola, and, and, and I want us to now get to, to the concluding parts of this. Um, you've run online learning for a period of time now, and, and, and it's, I presume, been successful for you guys. Um, what are the lessons that you've picked from it that other African young entrepreneurs, um, innovators in this space, learners in this space, what are some of those lessons that you leave with them that they need to take up on to make it a success? Uh, for, for the innovators, um, because learning online alone is, 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 could be difficult depending on how you take it. So apart from the forums and the wikis, we should have more engaging classes. There's a Zoom I attended and there was, there was the break had uh, dancing chairs. I mean, they put music and then they dance around the chair. You're alone, but the different cameras are showing. So it should be more, we should, they should come up with more engaging things or activities to, uh, to include the students. I'd start with localizing content. So make sure that you 
examples are relevant locally. Then another thing I would say is um, we underlook training. Even, even we may not know what we don't know. I think that every institution should have a training program, a training plan, um, and this should be in line. It should be towards um, enabling knowledge of these online learning experiences, and that will foster um, foster innovation in that space. So another thing I would say is um, the government and, and institutions need policies that you know favor online learning. If these policies are not in place, then you know we'll have an issue where people don't know what is happening. Everyone will have a hazard um, experience. Yes, so I'd say we need those. Can I add something? Yes. For, for the lectures online to be more interactive, I'd suggest that maybe lecturers make the class more interactive, like they share their content before. Let me say, assign students work so that when class is on, everyone has something to say. Or maybe group them and maybe put us into the breakout rooms and then we have a chance to interact. Know that if you're not there, someone will know that you're not there. So if at all they make us busy, that would increase on the attention among the students and also interaction with the lecturer. You're doing great at advising the lecturers. What advice would you give to your fellow <laughs> students around <laughs> learning online? Well, of course, I'd also tell them to pay more atten attention in class. You know, I'm talking out of experience, whereby this lecture is just so boring. And you feel like, ah, let me just get out of it. And you just leave the device on. I mean, my name shows that I'm in class, but I'm actually not. But if we pay more attention to this, it will be better for us to adopt more and actually find it interesting. For those who haven't found it interesting yet, yeah. We can start now. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. We've been speaking to experts who are working within the online and e-learning e space for higher universities across Africa. Of course, 77% of African universities were not able to continue their learning during the COVID-19 lockdowns. And the idea is to have those people continue their learning. So this show is really targeted at, at those people. And EdTech Monday, of course, comes to you monthly. It's an innovation from Innovation Village and the MasterCard Foundation to enable people within the edtech space to innovate, to talk to each other, and to draw up even policies that help them improve edtech outcomes from Africa. Thank you so much for watching us, and have yourselves a good day.